Lawrence Cohen. I'm the director of the Center for South Asian Studies. Um, and in a moment, I'll be introducing our guest, uh, Naomi Munawira, who uh, has just published uh, Island of a Thousand Mirrors. And there are also copies on sale outside. It's just been newly published. Um, before I do, um, uh, I want to also uh, uh, make an announcement, which is very exciting uh, to us, um, which is that um, the Center for South Asia Studies is just established uh, due to the gift of several donors, uh, led by Paramsoti Partipan Parthi, who's here, in the, in the, and uh, who I want to say something about in a moment. Uh, established the CSAS, the Center Awards in Sri Lankan Studies. These are awards which have been given to and administered by the Center, but are not limited to the Center. They're awards for trying to promote critical scholarship on Sri Lanka um, uh, in this country. So they are awards which are nationwide. Um, and there are two awards. There's the um, uh, uh, Center for South Asia Studies Dissertation Research Award in Sri Lankan Studies. Uh, and I just want to briefly read the description of the award. This grant is designed to support dissertation research for PhD candidates whose research focuses on Sri Lankan studies. We encourage proposals from students of any discipline in the social sciences. Ideally, research should focus on a particular aspect of post-war reconciliation. And the other award is uh, the CSAS Outstanding Paper Prize in Sri Lankan Studies. This award is designed to encourage work focused on the topic, the impact of Sri Lankan model in internal conflict and international diplomacy. And again, it's interdisciplinary. Um, and both these uh, awards uh, will uh, have submissions due this year on January 14th, 2013, and will be widely uh, publicized. Um, to give you a sense of the background of this grant and these awards, uh, Parthi belongs to a group, uh, the Tamil American Peace Initiative, um, and uh, in his words, in a letter to us, he notes, my objective is to generate more student interest on Sri Lanka and to get them to publish papers putting forward new and innovative ideas around conflict reduction and resolution. Um, and so this is an effort to really promote an open uh, terrain of critical scholarship, and we're quite grateful for that, and we hope that this really uh, uh, generates a shift, uh, both on this campus and more broadly. The, um, I'm an anthropologist by training, and when I was trained in the 1980s, uh, two of the most critical anthropologists working in South Asia were both from Sri Lanka and worked on Sri Lanka. That's Karanath Obi Sekri and my teacher, Stanley Tambaya. And um, the, but despite the critical urgency of the last 15 years, the, um, the moment of uh, Tambay and Obi Sekri has somewhat receded from anthropology, and so I'm very grateful for this grant um, to really push forward open and interdisciplinary uh, scholarship. The, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Naomi Munawira, uh, uh, and we're very grateful that she can be here. Um, um, she's a um, Sri Lankan American author. She grew up in Nigeria as well as in California. She was, I just learned at UC Riverside, uh, uh, and, and we're very grateful for our colleague Barbara Roy being here, uh, who she knew. Uh, this article was just, sorry, this book was just published, but she's also working and has worked on short stories. Um, I saw on the web that she has recently performed in a kabuki performance of Sri Lankan ghost stories. Uh, the, um, and she's uh, quite diverse in her engagements. The book, uh, as I've begun to read it, is, is quite, quite beautiful. And um, um, I'm very delighted that she's here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Center for South Asian Studies. Um, it's really great to be here and see all of you here on this beautiful day when you could be at the beach or doing something completely different, so thanks for coming out. Um, I'm going to be reading from and discussing my just published novel, which is called Island of a Thousand Mirrors. It was published, um, it came out about a month ago, so it's absolutely brand new. Um, and it, was, it came out in Sri Lanka, Singapore, and Australia by Pera Hussein, which is a small house in Sri Lanka, um, and in India by Hatchet India. And then it will be available here online and from me. So just a little bit about the book. It follows two families, one Singhal and one Tamil, through the long and brutal Sri Lankan civil war, um, which some of you might know a little bit about. 
Um, during the course of the novel, the Sinhala family migrates to California while the Tamil family stays in the northern um, zone which was contested and where there was active, active fighting going on. And the story is eventually at the end connected up in what I hope is an interesting and dramatic fashion. Um, a little bit of historical background. This ethnic conflict between the Sri Lankan government and the Tamil Tigers of Liberation Elam lasted from 83, 1983 to 2009. Uh, it's 26 years long. It claimed 80,000 to 100,000 lives. Um, so incredible devastation, a really long period of warfare. Um, so the ethnic minor the Tamil ethnic minority of Sri Lanka is about 13%. The Sinhala majority is about um, 70%. And um, the Tamil Tigers basically began as a liberation or revolutionary force, and they rightly decried the Sri Lankan government's racist policies towards the Tamil minority, um, and called for a separate autonomous nation called Tamil Elam in the north and the east of the country. Unfortunately, what happened over the years is that the Tigers devolved from a liberation force into a ter terrorist organization and used tactics, of, tactics such as child conscription, extortion, suicide bombing. Um, some of you might know about the suicide bombings. The Tigers actually deployed 378 suicide bombings during the time of the conflict, which was more than any other group in the world. Um, they also use female soldiers and female suicide bombers, one of the very few groups to do that internationally. The Sri Lankan government also used unmitigated force against Tamil civilians, incited race riots, and have been rightly accused of extreme human rights violations. So, um, my take on all of this is really clear. I'm not interested in politics. I'm not a historian or an academic. I am a writer, and as such, I'm interested in how people deal with chaos and the everyday presence of violence. I'm interested in how the psyche is formed when temples and buses are constantly under the threat of attack or being blown up. And I'm interested in the moment when the village you live in at any moment might be pillaged by soldiers. Um, and, and I'm interested in the psychological way of these things on a profoundly personal level for my characters. And I'm also interested in how war specifically affects women. Um, I want to make it really clear that my motivation in writing this book was to stress the commonality of suffering. The fact that both sides both dealt death blows and received irreparable harm. There are no innocents. Each side was complicit in a war of extreme brutality. The people who suffered the most were the ones without power or voice. Additionally, this book is about Sri Lanka, but I want us to keep in mind that there are similar conflicts, conflicts occurring all over the post-colonial globalized world. My characters are Sri Lankan, but this is also the shared narrative of so many others, Afghanis, Chileans, Iraqis, Palestinians, Colombians, Sudanese, you know, we could go on and on and on with that list. Um, and as Juno Diaz says, literature gains its universality by being very specific. I'm also gonna take a moment here to say that this book is also about much more than the war. I don't wanna reduce our common experience to only heartbreak and suffering. And in this way, in the book is also about love and hope. It's about love that crosses many boundaries. It's about the Sinhala families who hid Tamils during the race riots. It's about young Tamils coming to the rescue of Sinhala villages. So there are many love stories, coming of age stories, and all these other things. The book is also about migration and exile. The Singala family, as I said, moves to California specifically and deals with what it means to be new immigrants in this country, and I will be reading an excerpt from the book that deals with this. Recently, I've been reading Salman Rushdie's new autobiography, Joseph Anton, and in describing one of the catalysts for writing the Satanic Verses, he says, the act of migration puts into crisis everything about the migrating individual or group, everything about identity and selfhood and culture and belief. And this sense of crisis, of needing to completely redefine identity, is also something my characters are contending with. So the book is Many Beasts. However, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focusing the, mainly on the war, but please know that there's lots of love and growth and all these other things, happy, hopeful things happening in the book. Um, 
I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that I'm really blessed with the simultaneous gifts of proximity and distance, which are what made it possible for me to write this particular book. My family left Sri Lanka when I was three years old, and I grew up in Nigeria. However, my family would go back to the island every year for a month, and this continued into my adolescence when I came to America. And it was this access, as well as space and distance from the war, the safety that America, with all its contradictions, provided, which was pivotal in allowing me to write about this conflict. I say this because I don't think we've had much literature about the conflict emerge yet. There's been a few books, Anil's Ghosts, which I'm sure some of you are aware of, or have read, of course, July, which is by Karen Roberts, and The Road from Ele Elephant Pass, the author of whom was actually assassinated, but that's a different story. Um, but there hasn't been a great deal yet, and I believe that will change as people heal and begin to assimilate their experience, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, it's also incredibly significant to me that this book was initially published in Sri Lanka, Having a Sri Lankan publisher and editor means that the book was accepted and approved of by people who lived through events that I did not, and that means a great deal to me. So I'm going to um, read five sections. The first is a really short section, and basically it's about the period right after colonization, um, which happened, sorry, after um, independence in 48. So this is the moment where the British are leaving and the nation is trying to sort of figure out what, what it means to be an independent nation. Behind the retreating Englishman, on the new nation's flag, is poised a stylized lion, all curving flank and ornate muscle, a long cruel sword gripped in its front paw. It is the ancient symbol of the Singhala who believe that they're descended from the lovemaking between an exiled Indian princess and a large jungle cat. A green stripe represents that small and much tossed Muslim population. An orange stripe represents a larger Tamil minority. But in the decades that are coming, race riots and discrimination will render the orange stripe inadequate. It will be replaced by a new flag. On its face, a snarling tiger, all bared fang and bristling whiskers. If the idea of milit militancy is not conveyed strongly enough, dagger-clawed paws burst forth while cross rifles rear over the cat's head. A rifle-toting tiger, a sword-gripping lion. This is a war that will be waged between related beasts. So that was a description of the two flags, the Singhala government, the flag of Sri Lanka, which is a lion with a sword and the flag of the Tamil Tigers, which is actually a tiger with um, the rifles over its head. Um, I'm gonna skip to sort of the middle of the book, um, to incidents that happened in July 1983. And if anyone is um, familiar with this conflict, you know that July 1983 was sort of the catalyst point. Um, there were race riots in Colombo. Um, basically, Sinhala villagers came into the city and burnt down Tamil houses and businesses. A lot of Tamils were killed. It was really a moment that sort of set forth the things that sort of, you know, began the war. This is like kind of the moment. So I'm going to be talking about race riots in Colombo. It's told by um, the narrator who is talking about her pregnant aunt and her and her aunt's husband. If we could have entered the dead telephone lines that day, followed them across the burning city, down to our aunt's quiet bungalow and into her bedroom, this is what we would have seen. As smoke rises over Gall Road, as muffled screams make their way over her gate, and though there are still two months to go, our aunt Mala's belly is wrenching and twisting. It is the third day of 24-hour curfew, and Anuradha, white-faced, nails-bitten, pasta quick, has been watching his wife ride for the last two days. He says, the hospital, we have to go. And Mala gasping, no, Anu, please, it's only the heat and the baby kicking. He says, all right, I'll go and bring the doctor here. But she can't love this. Has terrible visions of what could happen to him out there in the unseen nightmare beyond their gate. 
He carries her to their old yellow Volkswagen, the tight, battered bada slippers dangling off her feet. She worries about this, the impropriety of leaving the house in her house slippers. But then Poonam has pulled open the gate and it is too late to ask for other, more appropriate shoes. They drive into the lane. A lull in the faraway shouting, the street festooned in sunlight and birdsong foliage spilling everywhere. And for a moment there is normalcy. The sense that they are leaving the house for a walk along Golfe's screen or Mount Lavinia Beach. They turn onto Golf Road, drive into thick rolling smoke, glimpse armed men, abandoned cars, looted shops. Mala, the aching of her womb, momentarily shot still, presses a knuckled hand against her mouth. Anuradha whispers, God, as the clearing smoke allows them to see. He is wrenching the wheel around homeward when the hand smacks splay fingered against the gloss next to Mala's head. A teenage boy in a torn, stained school uniform behind him, the mob congeals, and the boy in his terror scrambles onto the hood of their car. Through the garnet smears on the windscreen, they see the glint of knives, broken bottles, machetes. The mob surrounds them completely now, and though she cannot see the men's eyes, Mala knows they are expecting sacrifice. Knows that this Tamil boy in his school uniform, his face squashed against the glass so close to her own, the fish, the open fish mouth, the wide eyes, and that terrible gushing cut on his head has been chosen as sacrifice for years of broken governmental promises, deprivation, failed examinations, and decades of relentless physical labor. And the boy himself, knowing this, his hands raised to protect his delicate face, does not even beg for mercy. She hears a car door slam. She sees Anuradha push through the men, pull himself onto the car, his body in front of the boys. She hears his words through her own shuddering sobs. This child, he has done nothing. He is no problem for you. Her fingers struggle on the lock. She will jump out. They won't hurt a pregnant woman. There are greater laws they will abide by. She is sure of it. Just outside her window through the dirty glass, a machete is raised and hefted hand to hand. She sees a silver gleam of it and sinks slow in her seat. Anuradha negotiating. I can give you money, anything. Just let me take this boy and go. The voices. What do you got to do with this Tamil Basta? These motherfuckers are ruining the country. Think they can take over time to teach a lesson they won't forget. Crack some heads before they murder us in our beds. Move aside. Anuradha turns, wraps his arms around the covering boy. His eyes search for hers through the blood-smeared glass. She sees the blade raised and brought down, the flutter of his lids so familiar, his body jerking and then sagging as it has innumerable times over hers in the sanctity of their bed. But this time, it is the unnamed boy who receives his weight who shrieks the ear-shattering shrieks of an animal in terror, more blood than she can imagine, running onto the bright yellow paint of their car, and then a hundred hands reaching out and pulling him and the screaming boy into their midst. She's huddled on the floor of the car, arms wrapped around her belly when the door is eased open, a voice in Singhala whispers, Nona, come with me. She looks and sees Alvis, the coconut plucker, slum <coughs> denizen. Nona, let us go home now. His callous hands pull her onto the seat and then out of the car. The mob is gathered in front of the car, a blur of limbs and the metallic arc of weapons, but Alvis's sinewy coconut tree clasping arms will not allow her to break away, throw herself in the middle of the mob and beg for her lover's life. She is hurried away. When the smoke has cleared for a moment, she struggles loose, looks back to see men on the upturned car like flies on a day-old fisherman's catch. White cans upturned, gushing petrol. A roar as a spark ignites, catches burst into flame, the men's voices roaring and falling in time to the jumping flames, a dancing circle of men, those on the periphery pushing forward, curious to see what the center holds. A loud shriek as a sarong catches a flying cinder and the circle scatters open. And what is it that my dark aunt sees at this moment? Too grotesque to be revealed, surely too horrific to be imagined, but in the name of veracity, it must be told. Two vaguely human figures lurching in an almost comic fashion, garlanded each with a flaming tire, hands bound, 
black rubber melting onto skin, red flames dancing skyward funnels of smoke obscuring wide open mouths, a glimpse of damaged eye. The swirl of men closes ranks. The scene is shut out from Mala's eyes like a book of naughty illustrations slammed shut so fast that she almost cannot accept what she has seen. A soft rain of ash is falling, settling into her hair and her skin. At her ear, a steady stream of words. She knows she must concentrate on this to avoid losing herself. She knows she must walk home now without allowing what is sheltering within her to pour out like water onto this smoky street. Albus's lips close to her ear whisper, look down, glass madam, all over the road. She trains her eyes on her swollen feet in their tight rubber slippers, watches them curiously as they step carefully over broken glass. They move with a will she cannot recognize as her own. And she marvels at these feet, at their earnestness in moving away from loss, at the biology in her that has so assuredly chosen her unborn child over her dying husband. At the head of their lane, a bus is on its knees. Front tires exploded, hemorrhages, hemorrhaging, thrusting, pushing passengers. At the far side, a particularly jovial mob gathers. Reaching high above their heads, the, woman pull, the men pull a woman out of the small side window. They catch her sari palu pool, jumping and climbing on each other's so shoulders. Mala has stopped in the street, turned to salt Lot's wife, despite Alvis's panicked ur urgings. She sees the woman's open mouth, her arms flailing in this most exposed and airbound uncertainty between the bus and the men. A long streak of red bisects her forehead, and then, like a cork out of a bottle, the woman is dislodged. She falls into the circle of men, streaming to earth, sorry, fluttering like a parachute. A roar of delight drowns the woman's screams. Then again, the sound of gushing petrol, and finally, Mala allows herself to be pulled away down the street into the quiet of the lane. Her red gate within sight, the, smell, the scent is rising again, the thick fragrance of charred flesh like that which wafts from the Muslim quarter during Eid, the festing, festive ro roasting of animal flesh. She whispers to Alvis, not blood on her forehead, it was her potu. She must have tried to rub it off so they wouldn't know she was Tamil. It wasn't blood, it wasn't blood. Her mind turns over the image, the woman falling, the potu streaked across her forehead, the waiting men. She knows this is just a fixation. This fixation is just another trick of her biology to keep the other images far away. So, okay, I'm gonna read something fun now. <laughs> Cause I know that's very heavy for both you guys and for me too. Um, so this is from right about the middle of the book. Um, and as I said, the Sinhala family moves to California, to Southern California, which is a place you should never ever go. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, these are their first months, so they're getting used to what it means to be new to this country, you know. What do you eat? Where do you go? You know, like, who do you hang out with? Oh, everything's very new. Um, all right. Amma has never cooked before. It wasn't necessary, she says, Alice was always there. But now there is this necessity of feeding us, and so the recipes come, transcribed on onion skin, thin blue aerograms. Alice's words, transcribed through Sylvia Sinatra's hand to our mother's ear. She reads them, frowning, her mind fixed on the intricacies of substitution. What can she use in place of gotukola, jaggery, coconut oil? the myriad things that do not grow in this foreign soil. She must learn the skill of appropriation, to use spinach when the recipe calls for gotukala, brown sugar for jaggery, olive oil for coconut oil. On weekends, she takes us in search of potent spices and fresh vegetables. We brave Mexican markets where quivering brains, coiled intestines, and the enormous scarlet hearts of bulls line piles. Looking for red chili and turmeric, we buy exotic vegetables we have only ever seen in shiny foreign cookbooks, serrated broccoli, hard, cool white cauliflower. We bear these treasures home, heavy brown bags on our laps in the lurching bus. 
ignoring the, ignoring the curious sideway glances of other passengers. In the apartment, Amma roast curry powder in the oven. Lanka and I crush mustard and cumin seed with a mortar and pestle. Vegetables pile on the counters, carrot and beetroot greens, trailing off the edge like the blue-green plumage of tropical birds. Pots boil, spices fry, oil sizzle, sizzles. The room is shrouded in steam, which wafts into the hallways and makes our neighbors, those erstwhile Mexicans and dutiful Chinese, glance up curiously, inhale sharply and deeply. But they are only curious. They have their own foodie witchcraft to remind them of various homelands. It is only the envy-eyed landlady, her hair cut short, arm fat wriggling out of her sundress, who wrinkles her nose as she walks by our open window. She drags her equally overweight dachshund on the end of a leash and gossips about us to the dog. <laughs> oh, are they making your nose twitch, Wogans? These Indians always cooking with their onions and curry. How can they breathe in there? Must be used to it. Where they come from must seem like a palace. Inside, Lanka and I stifle giggles. She thinks we're Indian? We've never even been to India. Amma pushes a sweaty hand over her forehead and frowns. This landlady is the bane of her life, coming often to complain about the smells coming out of our windows or the noise we supposedly make. Amma is always sweet, polite, and courteous on these occasions. But now, inside the sanctity of her own kitchen, she whispers, Oh, my little woogums, why don't you come over here and kiss your mummy on the mouth with your dirty little dog breath, your filthy little dog here. Come here, little woogums. Mm. <laughs> she pantomimes a fat woman swaying elephantine walk, the way she holds the poor squirming dog high in the air, bringing it down to her lipstick mouth to kiss passionately. That the two, two has come into the kitchen now. The three of us hold our hands tight against our mouths to hold in the giggles, but it's no use. And outside, the landlady stands nonplussed, listening to the gales of laughter floating out of our window into the sunshine. Um, okay, a little bit of humor. <laughs> um, this is immediately after, but there's a little break. In these first years, we learn the lesson of our inadequacies. In school, we learn quickly that the smell of our bodies is shameful and must be dissipated by perfume, deodorant, that the hair on our legs that fine down, which we had never noticed before, must be shaved down daily to smoothness. That certain kinds of clothes are acceptable and these do not include the ones we have brought with us from the old country, or those that Amma, no matter how painstakingly, makes for us on her old beaten machine. We learn that acceptable clothes only come from stores, and for this reason, we become shoppers at the local bargain basements, Salvation Armies and Goodwills, looking for shirts, jeans, sweaters that will mark us as normal, as acceptable and undistinguished in the crowd. We learn also that hair conditioner comes in bottles and must be bought separately from cooking oil. <laughs> we learn that although we have been speaking English from birth, people cannot understand the crispness of the Queen's English mix mixed effortlessly with the roundness of Sinhala in our mouths. We have a sing-song accent, they say, a tendency to substitute we's when W's are called for, and vice versa, so that veil comes out sounding like a large sea mammal. Various conversations are thus rendered incoherent. These are lessons about shame learned by watching eyes, by noticing the way the other kids wrinkle their noses or pretend not to see us when we sit next to them on the school bus. By careful observation, we realize that adaptation and emulation will be necessary if we are to survive in this new place. So quite quickly, we learn to shed our old clothes, our old manners, we say cookie now, quite effortlessly, knowing that the word biscuit will be answered with blankness. All right. Um, big jump. Um, this is the second 
narrator. She's a young Tamil girl. She's growing up in the north of the country in the active war zone. Um, and this is the first time she's talking. Her name is Saraswati, and she's sort of introducing her milieu and what's going on around her. It is a dry season, and the lagoon reflects sunlight like the shards of a thousand broken mirrors. The village children used to come here to play, but I come here alone now. So many of them are gone, whisked away in speeding white army vans, or torn from the sides of dead fathers and bleeding mothers by the tigers. The others, the lucky ones, have run away to the IDP camps. You can tell where the camps lie from miles away by the smell. Thousands of people without running water or toilets, there is bound to be this terrible smell. So even when the gunfire echoes, I'm glad that Amma and Appa refuse to leave, that they keep us here in this small house by the lagoon. There were seven of us before. Amma, Appa, my brothers, Krishna, Balaram, Kumar, myself, and like a tail at the very end, my sister Lakshmi, who was named for the goddess with the long and lovely eyes. Lakshmi who provides all things material, a stream of golden coins pouring from her open palm. Whereas my Thangachi was named for the butter-skinned goddess of plenty, I was named for Saraswati, the serious-eyed and studious goddess of learning. When I complain to Amma, she only laughs and says, look how wisely we have named you. And it is true, because there is something in me that loves the glide of pages between my fingers, the stroke of my pencil, across paper, the hush of the village classroom. Even now, I'm studying for the teacher's examination. And next year, when I'm 17, I will take the exams, and maybe one day, I will be the village school teacher. But these are big dreams for someone living inside a war, so I don't speak of them often. Sometimes, I get this breathless feeling that the war is a living creature, something huge with a pointed tongue and wicked claws. When the tanks rumble past in the far fields, I feel it breathe. When the air strikes start and the blood flows, I feel it lick its lips. I've grown up inside this war, so now I can't imagine what it would be like to live outside it. When Amma and Appa tell stories of before, it is that world with plenty to eat and no airstrikes that is alien to me. What would it mean to live without the soldiers in their sandbag checkpoints, without the barbed wire, without the giant posters of martyred tigers? When the war first stroked its nails across the hearts of my brothers, Krishna and Balaram, they were older than me, but only little pieces of the men they longed to be. The tigers had come to our classroom. They showed us videos of what the Sinhala do to our people. They spoke of their leader, his lifelong struggle for Elam, a homeland where we would be safe from the Sinhala. But determination shone on my brother's faces. They wanted so much to help our people, but also to be known as brave and valiant fighters. They came home quivering with hate, the war shining in their eyes. When they ran away to join the movement, Amma didn't cry. She kept her back straight and her eyes glistened only with pride, and I, convinced by her strength, hid my own tears. I was so proud of their fearlessness. Sometimes Amma takes Lakshmi and me to the martyr's cemetery. We search through that forest of headstones until we find Krishna and Balaram's names, and then Amma cries over her sons, but I don't because, this, because these graves only hold rust-colored earth. My brother's bodies were torn apart over the disputed territories, leaving us no fragment to mourn. It is outside the cemetery that my brothers haunt me. When the earth of the onion fields is made ready for planting, I wonder if this is where Balaram's blood splattered onto the ground. The lagoon, in a particular light, makes me, makes me hear a quiet splash. Then I see Krishna's face floating, his mouth open, his uniform sagging the water, tinting rose and then scarlet around him. Sometimes, I'm certain it was easier, a quiet click underfoot and then instant incendiary light, the swiftness of the landmine. I hope that's how they went. Much better, faster and sharper than bleeding in the onion fields or a heavy boot into the lagoon. This is what happens when you don't know the way someone died. 
All the other possibilities come crawling until your head is packed full of death. But I'm getting better at pushing away these thoughts with both hands. The last time we saw either of the boys was about three years ago. They had been granted leave from the camp, and for days before they came, Amma brought lentils for Wade, stirred batter for Appam, and fried a whole fish, the scent of it making us all weak need. We hadn't eaten like that in months. When they came, they ate and asked for more, but they kept their guns strapped to their backs while their fingers moved through the food. When they smiled, only their mouths moved. They looked to the left of me, to the right of me, but their eyes slid <coughs> off my face like water. They didn't praise Amma's food. They didn't speak of the weeks we ate unsalted rice so they could feast. They talked only of Elam, of their weapons, and how many busted Sinhala soldiers they had killed. When they left, Lakshmi and I fell upon their banana leaves, scooping up the last bits of appam, rasam, and the precious bits of fried fish into our mouths. That was the last time we saw them, and now their faces have grown dim. I can only picture them in their uniforms, not as they were before when we were children together, playing by the band, the slap of our slippers echoing across the lagoon in time to our laughter. Kumar, my youngest brother, had eyes like a girl's, dark as a she cow's with great curling lashes. When Amma brought out her dancing saris, he'd run his palms slowly over the silk as if they were the pelts of animals. He would put on her silver ankle bells and dance the gopis or Radha so skillfully that Amma laughed and called him her favorite daughter. We fought over those bells, each of us determined to dance most like Amma. After Krishna and Balaram were killed, Amma kept Kumar close to her all the time. She couldn't bear to lose her lost son, she said. She had given two sons to the cause, and she wanted to keep this one for herself. Even by that time, he was, for the time when the war was over, she said, clutching him to her, even though by that time he was taller than her and didn't want to be held. She kept him in the house all the time. But that year, in the malarial months after the monsoon, we all had shaking, dripping fevers, and there was only Kumar to go to the market. The soldiers came for him then. Kanama, the old market woman, saw it, the white van swerving to a stop in a cloud of red dust, the nose of a gun glinting through the open doors. We have not seen Kumar in two years. He would be 18 now, and I don't think I would know his face if I saw it. Amma never cries for Kumar. This is because she thinks he's still alive. At the end of each day, when the sun is falling quickly over the water, the bats starting to stream over the violet dust sky, she stands at the door waiting for him. She never says his name, but I know she is still waiting. Stupid Amma. Every time she does this, I must fight myself not to grab her shoulders and hiss the truth into her face. He is never coming back. He will never walk through the door with Brownie at his heels, a bag from the market over his shoulders, smelling like Kumar, that particular mix of boy sweat and dust. There are soldiers everywhere, and when they take you, you do not ever come back. But I can never say such things to Amma. One day, she will know that her youngest son, too, is gone, and for him, she will not even have an empty grave to cry over. All right, one more. One more, um, not terribly depressing one. <laughs> Smile, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, last thing, it's, um, this is sort of uh, a very long, long, long sentence. Um, this is what Yasodhara, who is my Singhala character, thinks of as she is leaving Sri Lanka for the last time they're migrating to um, California, so you heard her voice sort of in the middle. And these are her last thoughts as she's leaving. A few months later, we are packed and flying across the world to start a new life, our hearts thudding, fearful in our mouths. As the plane takes off, I rest my forehead against the window, and below me the island glistens verdant green. I imagine all that it holds. Such things of horror and exhilaration as are seldom gathered together. The stratiated lands of the north stretching into the sea, the quiet, lonely lagoons, the creeping, fearful soldiers, the firework explosions, the villagers on bicycles, the gleaming Colombo towers, the high-rise hotels of tourists and expatriates, 
the clubs that boast signs reading no locals, the leprous beggar on the streets, his palmless, his fingerless palms spread forth in supplication to the slick fashionistas, the half-naked European women, the foreign men grinding over the buttocks of brown boys, the serene-faced Buddha statues, the rock fortress of Sigir with its ancient long-eyed swan-breasted nymphs, the black shape of a water buffalo with its ubiquitous shoulder-riding white egret, the jade spread of paddy, the deep green of tea, the lonely village roads, the dark forest, the wild elephants, the stick thin stilt fishermen poise over the surging water, praying for their next meal while the ca cameras of tourists click away, the tired housemaid, newly arrived from the really newly re returned from the Middle East, the spired churches, a scent of jasmine, so potent that it catches the attention of traveling poets and writers, lures them here and will not let go. And always, always, the ever-turning sea, returning on itself, wiping away every footprint. These are the things I am saying goodbye to. I turn my head from the window as fear and liberation beat in equal measures through my bloodstream. That's it. process um, what you said about the Salman Rushdie quote about mm -hmm. you know writing specifically to capture the universality I just wanted to say you captured it really eloquently you know I myself am an, an immigrant I'm sure there's a lot of people here who are but you just captured things in a really lovely way so thank you for that my question is I'm noticing you've got a quote by Janet Fitch there who wrote <coughs> White Oleander I'm wondering how that came Oh, well, great question. Love to answer with this, start with this question. Um, so if, I don't know if you guys know White Oleander. Um, this is a book that came out like 10 years ago by this woman, Janet Fitch, who is amazing. Um, and she actually said that book, which became a huge hit. Um, it was set in LA, and it was a huge inspiration for the parts that I wrote about LA. Um, and I met her at a writing conference, and we, she became somewhat of a mentor. Um, and eventually she wrote my blurb, which was really hugely just like, oh my God, you know, like amazing for me. So yeah, that's how it happened. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, so I think if you could um, talk a little bit about how you did research for the book. I mean, did you make several trips to Sri Lanka? Was it over a long period of time? Just read a lot of newspaper right, right. article. I mean, what yeah, you I mean, yeah, I mean, as I said before, I grew up sort of partly in Sri Lanka. Um, so we left Sri Lanka when I was three in '76, and I grew up in Nigeria. Um, and then I came to California when I was 12. But we would make trips every year. We would spend quite a lot of time there, um, and most of my family is still back there. Um, so it was that. So I had a sense. You know, but it was also definitely a lot of research. You know, like at that time, uh, when I was writing this, the war was still going on. So there wasn't a tremendous amount of information coming out, especially about the tigers. So those parts were the parts that I really had to do a lot of research because, you know, the north and the east, especially the north of the country, wasn't even opened up. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, how did you? Mm -hmm. It wasn't even opened up till very recently. Yeah. So I actually have never been to the north. Um, so it was a lot of research. It was reading everything I could find. Um, and as you guys might know, the tigers um, would commit suicide before they would reveal their secrets. They all had cyanide capsules around their necks, um, pendant. Um, and so it was really difficult to get information. And I just read everything I could. Um, yeah, it sort of filled in the gaps as well as I could. And how long did you take to write this book? I mean, uh, this gone? book took five years. And I started 10 years ago. Um, a lot of that was because there wasn't information coming out. I was also teaching, so it was a part-time thing. Um, it took five years to write and, yeah, complete act of, I'm writing a book. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. How many drafts do you think you must have Oh, my God. From? And did you change the, the plot? Oh, yeah. It changed tremendously. I mean, the characters that I started out with actually didn't even make it on the page. 
and recently I looked at all my drops and I threw them away and it's you know it's like that and then this is this is what showed up yeah. so uh, many 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 drops yeah. have you uh, gotten any comments from Tamils who read your book or have you talked to any um, you know, lately or you know well, it's only been out a month, okay. so there hasn't been tremendous, there haven't been a lot of reviews yet, but mm -hmm. what I've heard has been really positive. Um, I've had like various Tamil friends that I have read it, but I mean, I don't know, I won't know until it's sort of out more. Um, but as I said, you know, I don't know, I, I'm trying to present both sides as well as I can. So, yeah. So you mentioned that the book is published by a Sri Lanka publishing house, yeah. and, uh, so, and it was launched a month ago. Yeah. I'm wondering whether there were um, any official launch events in Sri Lanka and how they, how they, uh, what your impression of those have been, right. um, particularly given the sort of uh, the backdrop of uh, the narrative of the, the war in Sri Lanka, particularly the last couple of chapters of the war. So the government's narrative has dominated. Right. Um, it's a narrative that you know this was the war is over, right. and um, perhaps we should have done this much much earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, and there continues to be a lot of repression, particularly Absolutely. journalists and mm -hmm. activists. And so you know, your readings today certainly speak to you know phenomenon of things like forced disappearances, the race riots in the eighties. And, and these are things which are sort of have been very much sanitized yeah. from uh, just sort of certainly the government and a lot of popular narratives since the end of the war, to, you know, quote unquote, end of end the war of 2009. The war. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether you could sort of speak a little bit more to that in terms of this, this certainly is um, uh, really exciting to see this kind of discourse um, given that sort of empirically based social scientific discourse, um, the, the spaces for that have completely shut down. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. I'm going to Sri Lanka in February, and I'm going to be reading at the Gaul Literary Festival, which is the big festival in Sri Lanka. Um, it was a brave decision on the part of my publishers to publish this book, you know, um, and I have no idea what the backlash is going to be. As I said, it just came out. We'll see, is all I can say. As I said, as you said, lots of people have disappeared. Um, the person that wrote The Road from Elephant House, which is a book that came out about, I don't know, six years ago, that, that author was assassinated. So it's, it's contentious, um, to say the least. I don't really know. Like, all I can say is I'll go back and see what happens. And you're thinking about having sort of launch events and these kind of um, press in, will in some of the sort of cities like Toronto, or London, yeah. Yeah. where Melbourne are yeah. very large um, diasporic yeah. communities. And I'm not sure we can yeah, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. Um, so I've been invited to speak in Toronto. In a there's a year long writer series by a group called Sri Lankans Without Borders. Do you know them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to be there in no, end of November speaking, so that's the first one, and hopefully Toronto and London and all those other places too, so, yeah. And, yeah. So, in the talk, you, you had these very violent passages, you know, responding to a very specific you know, history of, of, of violence, and then in part given that you still now something funny is, I mean, how do you think about the sort of wide shift in the different kinds of registers of writing, yeah. how you move between these, and, and, and how you think about I mean, uh, I sort of gravitate towards writing the tragedy, especially with a subject like this, right? You're talking about a 26 year long war, how do you not look at the ugly stuff? Um, but it's very necessary to have those moments of levity, to have those moments of comedy that really speak to like we're all humans and we all laugh and love and those those moments are really important um, and I need them as a writer because it's, you know, doing readings where I'm only reading the war stuff is, it's hard for me to read, you know, like I still have read it many times but it still affects me because people went through this, this is stuff that really happened 
to people. Um, so you're asking like how I shift as a writer? Uh, just You just write scenes of different times, you know, whatever is sort of coming up, whatever the book wants you to work on is what you work on that day, and then you go into the heavy stuff like, okay, today I'm gonna be doing this stuff, and then step away from it, yeah. Is that it? Oh. Does the um, 88-89 JVP uprising figure in your book? And connected to it, I was wondering why, how it is that the single family is pushed to immigrate. To immigrate. Um, so I don't take on the JVP issue just because it would have been such a bigger book, you know, so I wanted to just focus on the, the Tigers versus the Sinhala government. Um, and why do they immigrate? Just, um, you have to read the book. <laughs> I don't, it's a bit of a spoiler if I give it away, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. so thank you very much. And before, before we have a little, little reception, um, but I just wanted to let you know, the, uh, actually we have, um, and please take a description of both of the, the uh, awards. And again, I just wanted to extend our thanks. And please pick one up for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>